Great, okay, I'll sign myself. I'm going to be going through this quite quickly, so um, if you've got any questions, um, just have to catch me afterwards. I um, hope you all enjoyed yourself. Thanks, Gabby, for the head team for organising Sunnyfest. So, what I'm going to present to you today is um, a small project I've been doing in the last month and a half, um, month, looking at um, the, uh, the area of neuroscience and this idea of iconic triggers, which are essentially um, when neuroscientists measure brain response in response to advertising and other branded communication, they measure these signals. And can semiotics help us understand that in some way? That's the sort of um, question that I want to ask. Right. Which, which button do I press? On the middle? Yeah. To the right. Okay, let's just... Okay, so essentially, so why did I want to write this paper? Well, um, I had a long-standing question, which is kind of how does a science actually embodied in the mind, how do we know which ones are actually crossing the threshold? I'm not going to be able to answer that question, but in case you're really excited, I'm afraid no answers exactly, but some more questions. The frustration of being asked uncomfortable questions about clients, how can we know what we claim about sign processing? Um, and the precedent that I have in my research interest, I've written papers both on sound and music and look at how the auditory system is closest to the way we process emotions, which means that Anyone that's looked at a film and has been affected by a John Williams soundtrack or other soundtrack or Angelus or whatever knows how powerful sound is in, in priming our emotions. So I'm interested in that. So I've done, written a paper on how we, um, when we meditate using Percy and sim, um, sign theory. And I also want to educate myself a bit more in, in terms of how this, this all works. Um, and it was inspired by a debate um, on the semi thinking group, which again was spawned by Massimo Dioni's Decalogue, which went on for about 150 comments, and only was relevant for about 30 votes. So, but there was a debate about neuroscience and semiotics. And also, I met someone at a conference who works for a neuroscience agency, so I thought I could um, use her, use that connection. So. I haven't, this is really preliminary findings, I've got a few thought starters, I've not got the answer, but I will write a paper on the base off the back of this. Um, essentially I've done some readings of um, those who have read me in neuroscience, like Antonio Damasio is really amazing on like, the relationship between emotion and um, consciousness and how emotion helps us make decisions. Ram Chandran um, on um, the brain and the secret life of the brain. And also Daniel Kahneman as well, systems one and two thinking. And all of this is just showing, uh, helping us understand how the brain works, but also how we can't be conscious of some of the things that the brain makes us want to do. And this is an interviews uh, with neuroscientists and people that work at Neuro Insight, which is the agency that helped me and gave me some access to their data. But I welcome comments and constructive feedback on this presentation at some point. Um, so the rise of neuromarketing. So. Essentially, there are a lot of neuromarketing agencies out there, and essentially they help clients make decisions based upon the way their measurements they make in terms of brain waves and the way people react to advertising. Um, and the two factors was explained to me by Richard Silverstein, who heads up NeuroInsight in Australia. Two factors: the pull and pull push factors. Pull factors. There's, you know, there's a quote that says we'll learn more about the brain and functional specialisation in the brain in five years than we did for well, 100 years before that since William James, probably, in philosophy, writing about psychology in the early 1900s, we're able to pinpoint different regions of the brain, functional specialisation, there's a bursting of different techniques for doing this measurement, an fMRI, which measures hemo blood flow, to EEG, which measures um, um, electric flow, and then galvanic skin response, all sorts of things, and the cost of equipment is going down. The push factors are essentially that we realise increasingly the massive capacity for self-illusion amongst human beings, that we tend to create narratives about what we, how we behave, what we think, that aren't, don't actually bear out the reality. And ethnography shows this, but also neuroscience. And also just understanding about how low-level processing works and how we actually process brain communication. So this has made neuro, neuromarketing more attractive, plus the quantification and the fact that clients can see pictures of brain. Um, so, yeah. So just one of the things about this, um, you know, that the brain essentially is, is, is split into two hemispheres, the left and the right. The left is more so-called rational, processing more language, 
although there are other areas that are associated with this, and the right brain is more to do with colours and, and, and more creative uh, interpretations. And the, the sort of, the, 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 the kind of um, paradox of verbal and visual thinking is, is hopefully encapsulated in this. If I was to say, um, say the colour but not the words, for any of those, your brain kind of gets paralysed. It's difficult to do it at speed because one part of the brain wants to say one, the colour, and the other one wants to say the word, so that's an example. Um, so you would think on the surface neuroscience and semiotics would have no, nothing in common. Um, one's sort of about um, inductive reasoning, one's about inductive reasoning, one's about neurobiological facts, one's about semiotic observation, one's about lab experimentation, one is about close reading and quantitative validity versus interpretive validity. But actually, you know, towards the bottom we've got some, um, sorry, it's a bit garbling with the, um, the formatting. Um, there are ways in which semiotics and neuroscience are talking about the same thing, which is in different ways. So I would argue cultural memes, the way they spread, the fact that human beings have this capacity for imitation, and that's located in the mirror neurons. We call semiotics and sign, process, sign processing, quant they call it quantized experience. And event boundaries are essentially when the brain stops processing a quantum experience, and there's an attentional blink, so it's not focused anymore, until the next chunk of experience. And essentially, People like Berto Eco are always talking about what's the minimal unit of meaning in architectural poetry, what's the morphology of meaning, when does the sign stop and the text begin, all that sort of stuff. So it's a similar sort of thing. And somatic markers in the brain, when residual impressions have been left, you know, person call that interpretants, they're interpretants working in the brain. So, and both neuroscience and semiotics have got um, a, a, a sort of distrust of reported opinion, so I think they agree on that score. So neural insight work on the basis of steady state topography, which overcomes the issues associated with other techniques. I won't really go into too long, but essentially they measure the flicker of brain response in um, response to advertising. Um, and that can be really useful because it helps um, you see where the brain is encoding certain um, parts of the communication and it helps them um, re-edit things and, and, and um, it helps them feed into clear briefs for, for creative development, for example. Um, and there's this notion of iconic triggers. So iconic triggers are core elements that can evoke the whole network of associations people have with brands, sounds, colours, shapes, etc. And in terms of what an iconic trigger is, it's basically a peak of brain response, so it's sensory stimulus associated with high levels of memory coding. And there's been a site, there's been experimentally been a strong link made between memory encoding and advertising effectiveness. So if you something goes into the brain, it looks like it's going to be um, encoded strongly in terms of neural networks, you're more likely to remember it, and that has an influence on brand impressions as well. Um, and there's iconic is a colloquial term, they're more iconographic. And I come on to why I don't think they're really iconic in semiotic terms anyway. And there are two types of trigger. There's like the acute trigger, which is just in a one-off communication, and then there are ones that are established over time, essentially. Um, I was going to show you an ad, hopefully it will work. Can you click on it? So you've probably seen this. Actually, a big debate on the centre of thinking group about the meanings in the ad, um, the first debates we had. But essentially, if you go to the next slide, which hopefully we can bring up, there's a little tiny bit on what iconic triggers are. Um, and essentially, um, so the next slide, yeah. If you, yeah, just animation on that. Yeah, 
So the first slide is it's a gorilla, it's kind of recognition. I mean, this is not always as obvious as this, but just to give you an idea what our kind of triggers are. So you look at the, the, the waves, it's a kind of, this is against the benchmark, he's playing the drums, and it's a capital shot. So you can look at one level, it's just about new information, but it's much more, a bit more complex than that. Um, and essentially what semiotics could help with is what, what drives iconic triggers, what makes something an iconic trigger, that's the, the big question. And the question for me is, in this sort of breaking down semiotics into three areas, semantics, syntaxis and pragmatics. Syntax, semantics is basically how, what the meaning of the sign is. Syntaxis is how signs link together and pragmatics is how interpreters engage with signs. If it's syntaxis, is it just about, thank you, is it just about how one piece of information is new and it's not the last piece of information, or is it something inherent in that piece piece of information itself, essentially? That's a big question about iconic triggers, which may not be answered. One thing I would say is that you know this is it's a sign. We know that there's some kind of a sign of something because there's a trigger response. So the sign is something that stands to someone for something in some respect or capacity. Something by which we know something more. We know we know something more because memory encoding has been um, increased, but we don't know what the what the actual referent is. What's the meaning of that sign? Is there any meaning at all? And what does it stand to for that person? Um, in what sense can iconic triggers be said to be iconic? When a sign, an iconic sign is something that's about simulation. Um, I would suggest in my in terms of my preliminary um, ideas in terms of Purse, I would suggest that there's more of a visceral response to these um, communications, more indexical, it's kind of a blind compulsion response, it's either about referring what you see to what happened before it's different, which is a secondness, or if it's something that's been established over a time, it becomes a habit. So you refer to the brand over time and you learn, and that's the symbol. So actually, in terms of iconicity, um, there is no, I don't think they would be really properly called iconic sites, they should be properly called iconic sites. In terms of how can you shed more light in terms of what these um, these signs are, what drives them, well there's the cognitive index, how many connotations are invested in an image, and the, the, one of the hypothesis would be the more connotations are invested in the image, um, the more likely people are to puzzle it out and therefore memory will probably go up. So this is a virgin ad, and these are the four people's response in the ad. The question would be what what are the connotations is it to do with the virgin archetype? the statue of liberty, the fly metaphors in there. Again, I haven't really got a big corpus of information yet. It's just some indicative ideas. Next slide. Um, narrative congruence. I did a case study on the Change for Life campaign. It was a sort of government campaign looking at obesity and trying to stop that. And again, looking at narrative arcs and how people build expectations based upon what happened, based upon their conditioning as a cultural as a cultural being and a side person. I think that can help um, in general, interpretive power into what neuroscientists do without even resorting to sort of grimace or narrative schema. I just think seeing this basic innocence return to the innocence narrative for a prehistoric idol through capitalist enemy to utopian resolution. Neuroscientists don't know any of that stuff, and this can help them understand what underlies response. This is really interesting, I haven't got time to go into great detail, but essentially, semantic density is the idea of what is the critical part of a logo any visual field that really conveys the meaning and what parts are redundant and there's a study done in poland where essentially they showed three types of sign um, the obvious logo the garbled logo and it got a logo with a, a no logo at all and essentially people would recall seeing the logo better if it was a garbled logo and they think it's because people have in their brain um, a resistance to being sold too explicitly, but if it's subliminally put across, something comes across semantically, but not, not perceptually. Is there a way of, of looking at how these signs, if they appear in advertising, how they affect memory and code of the brand? Next. Um, yeah, and also just sound, because I mean, I guess I'll just skip over this and say if you want to learn more about sound, read my, my paper with Alex Gordon on sound, but essentially, Sound auditory cortex is closer to our emotions and it circumvents, easy to circumvent our skepticism of things through sound. And the iconic, tri the iconic triggers that are, are sonic are the more, most powerful that they show me this neuroinsight agency. So, how can semioticians help them understand about multimodalities, how you communicate through different media? Next. Um, so, in terms of a research program, future research program, I would suggest. I'd like to maybe talk to cognitive semioticians. After all, that's what they specialise in, the link between neuroscience and semiotics. Get hold of more data. 
I commissioned eye tracking so I could see what people were looking at when this memory encoding was going on. I do these commutation tests on multimedia text, um, and I'd start to maybe put, actually do the other way around, put optimized stimulus in there and see how it could raise levels of memory encoding. Uh, and there's a neuroaesthetics too. Final slide. Yeah, so basically, so-called iconic triggers are still a mystery, and the quarry is still at the early stage. But some conclusions can be drawn. I mean, I don't think iconic triggers are strictly iconic, either in the celebrity sense or in the semiotic sense. They're more like indexical or symbolic signs. And it appears they have as much to do with syntactics as semantics, by which I mean there's a priming function in terms of what came before and after. It's more about that than anything inherently semantic in the sign. Um, but I'll just think as a final couple of conclusions, semiotics and neuroscience, sorry, you... sorry. <laughs> semiotics and neuroscience do not need to be mutually antithetical, they might even be complementary. Neuroscience yields strong biological facts indicating body processes and interpretants that make for a semiotic perspective. Semiotics has a rich conceptual toolkit for dissecting multimedia texts and can therefore help generate rich plausible hypotheses for neuroscientists. Thank you.